Go ahead. Make it go forward. Uh -huh. This thing. Yep. Back and All forth. Right. And, and Great. And stay close to me. Okay. Well, good morning. I'm very honored to be participating in this uh, prestigious uh, symposium. Um, I'll say at the outset that as the director of the NIAID Integrated Research Facility, we are in the business of developing medical countermeasures for those organisms which require high levels of biocontainment. And what keeps me up at night is what happens if one of my lab workers uh, catches his experiment. And um, we do have medical treatment facilities. The Special Containment Studies Unit in Bethesda will handle uh, cases of uh, occupational exposures from the Fort Detrick campus. Um, CDC, of course, has Emory. And about two years ago, um, I convened a symposium with, uh, with two colleagues, Rick Davey and Lisa Hensley, um, bringing the medical directors of those various facilities together to review medical countermeasures that could be possibly pre-positioned in those facilities so they'd be available on short notice. Um, and it was somewhat uh, disturbing at that time that there were no medical countermeasures that could be pre-positioned. And the best we could do was to uh, review the literature and see where things were in the pipeline and to try to get an assessment of what we felt would, were the most promising things. And, and this lay the groundwork, actually, for what's been happening recently where there was a meeting uh, several weeks ago at the World Health Organization where Mike Carrilla uh, reviewed the state of the art. And I'm drawing very heavily from Mike's slides here. I thank him for uh, uh, providing them to me. And this makes it go, huh? There we go. And this is the famous disclaimer. Uh, you know, um, I am an NIH employee, but I'm not recommending anything. I'm just reviewing the literature. And these are my opinions and those of my colleagues. And um, the caveat also that the assessment of efficacy is based uh, almost solely on animal testing data. Um, up until recently, there was no experience with any of these countermeasures. Of course, recently, there has been some experience, and I'll get to that in time. When you look at animal models, um, you know, there are animal models for Ebola using mice and guinea pigs and non-human primates. For obvious reasons, non-human primates are regarded as the best disease models. But of course, one has to be careful in interpreting uh, these data. In vitro doesn't equal rodents, doesn't equal primates, doesn't equal humans. And there's usually insufficient clinical disease data to assess comparability between humans and, and non-human primates. We actually know more about pathogenesis in non-human primates than we do in humans. Um, interventions targeting host cell functions may be impacted by subtle species differences among the viruses. Drug metabolism may complicate identifying correct dosing. Some of the more promising drugs have funny PK in monkeys, and you have to watch out for that. And off-target effects may differ between humans and non-human primates. I won't go into this other than to say that Ebola is a fairly simple virus, but still has a fairly complicated uh, life cycle, and there are a number of points for intervention, both in its replication strategy and in its interaction with the um, innate immune system. So the way I'm going to go through this today is I'm going to go through the available vaccines first, followed by therapeutics, and within each category, um, uh, tell you what's known about non-human primate efficacy data and with uh, what we know about human dosing. And, and the way we like to present this is to have a, a virtual product label. And you can see there that, you know, who makes it, description of the product, where is it in development, how does it act, um, efficacy data in um, non-human primates if available, human safety data if it's available, available product quantities if it's known, manufacturing and capacity, you know, can it be ramped up, and if so, how quickly? And um, other considerations, can it be used as post-exposure prophylaxis or treatment or in combination? So let's talk about vaccines. First, you're talking about vaccines as general use. Um, this is for pre-exposure in at-risk populations and the like. So considerations are the number of doses. Can you get away with a single dose or is a prime boost strategy required? How long uh, does it take to provide protective immunogenicity? the duration of that immunity, and the possibility that the vaccine will only reduce disease severity, uh, although it will increase survival. And then the question for some of these vaccines is, is there an opportunity, is there a window of opportunity for post-exposure prophylaxis? And is the dose the same uh, for that strategy, or is it going to be higher than for general use? Okay, so the vaccines which, um, which are getting 
Uh, some traction right now is uh, one developed at the Vaccine Research Center at NIAID in conjunction with GlaxoSmithKline. It's based on the chimp adenovirus 3 um, uh, vector uh, with the Ebola glycoprotein gene inserted um, along with the Sudan gene. In non-human primates uh, um, uh, immunized uh, in anticipation of infection that's 100% uh, protective, and it is now in phase one uh, testing in this country. Um, the vector itself, the CHIMPAD3 vector, has been in over 200 subjects, and the Ebola glycoprotein um, uh, vaccine has now been in about 80 subjects uh, in, uh, in the phase one study, which um, is being conducted, uh, will eventually have 200 people. Um, the company projects 15,000 doses of the monovalent vaccine to be available in December, and its current sturge is at minus 80 degrees, and it's known to be stable uh, for a protracted period of time at minus 20. The other vaccine which is getting a lot of attention is one based on vesicular stomatitis virus, VSV. Uh, same idea, the, um, the, the uh, glycoprotein of VSV is traded out for the glycoprotein of Ebola Zaire. It was actually developed about 10 years ago at the Public Health Agency of Canada, PHAC, and is now licensed to NewLink, um, or bioprotection, which is in the process of ramping it up. There is an IND. Um, it is effective as a single dose. It a uh, general use uh, vaccine. It's known to be protective at 100% within 21 days. And there is some data that suggests it is effective when given almost immediately less than an hour after uh, exposure in non-human primates. Um, it was, um, actually the slide is now out of date. It was used uh, several years ago for a lab accident in Germany. It has now been subsequently used in some of the patients uh, evacuated to the United States. Um, there are about 1,400 doses of it available now, and as I said, it's being ramped up. Other vaccines, there's lots of them out there, uh, but they are, um, you know, further back in the pipeline. Uh, Profectus has a VSV uh, platform, which is a trivalent. Uh, Bavarian Nordic has developed a vaccine based on MVA. Uh, Crucell has the adenovirus 3 platform, which probably isn't going to be useful in Africa. Uh, Crucell also has a combined modified vaccinia, MVA adenovirus vaccine. Uh, the Army is developing uh, VLPs at USAMRID, and Thomas, Johnson uh, Thomas Jefferson University has both live and inactivated recombinant rabies vectored vaccines, which actually look very good, and that one is coming up fast. Okay, so the timelines for CHIMPAD3, VRC has already started um, um, uh, phase one testing. You can see other tests are scheduled to occur. Um, 15,000 doses for phase two um, will be available in December, and this is actually a late breaker that um, I, I understand that there is now a three-arm clinical trial developing in Liberia involving 30,000 people. 10,000 people on each arm. One arm gets CHIMPAD3, one arm gets VSV, and the third arm gets an unrelated um, vaccine, probably hepatitis. Um, okay, and there's that. So the target populations for vaccines are obviously frontline healthcare workers, uh, the contact cases and a ring vaccination, um, other high-risk exposures, and potential immediate post-exposure use with a clear case definition. Okay, so now we're going to turn to um, therapeutic considerations, agents with antiviral activity, which may either target the virus directly, could target a host cell function required for its life cycle, or something that augments host defenses. And, um, and then other host-directed uh, therapies will be discussed as well. Okay, all the products are still under development. Uh, the actual treatment doses and regimens are uncertain at the present time. The mechanism of action may dictate, you know, temporal usage. They may be effective early, but not late. We don't know. And host factors may impact efficacy and must also be considered. So we've all heard about ZMAP. Uh, ZMAP is the monoclonal antibody cocktail. In our medical director's meeting, um, a predecessor of ZMAP was selected as the one the medical directors felt most comfortable using because there are 
comfortable with the idea of uh, passive immunization. It's been used effectively in many other diseases, and the animal efficacy data looked really very good. Uh, this is actually uh, produced in tobacco plants. At least two of the three monoclonals are. The third is produced at Health Canada in, um, in Cho cells. Um, the um, the pre-IND has been used now seven cases in seven cases. Um, it has two neutralizing antibodies in, in the cocktail and one ADCC. Um, ZMAP is 100% effective when initiated in a trigger to treat protocol in experimentally infected monkeys. Once they are both febrile and have viremia, <clears throat> it is still 100% effective. This is pretty darn good. There are no controlled human safety data. There is none of it. It's been used. Um, but they're ramping up production. They expect to have 12 to 20 doses drop in a bucket uh, by December. And as I've mentioned, has now been used several times in patients evacuated to Europe. Um, and although all but one of those patients ultimately survived, it's unclear whether the, um, whether the ZMAP actually had any beneficial effect because nobody has been measuring viremia before and after infusion, so we don't, just don't know. Um, human convalescent serum, of course, has been used many times in the past. It was used with uh, seven of eight patients in Kikwit, and the waning days of that outbreak survived. Um, but it was really impossible to assess again whether that had anything to do um, with their survival. I can tell you in experimentally infected monkeys, when we have survivors and we take their plasma and use it in a passive immunization scheme, it rarely, if ever, works. And the only time it works is when you concentrate it and make an IgG, IVIG, highly concentrated, then it works. But, um, you know, so again, um, uh, collecting immune plasma in the field and using it uh, in that environment is fraught with some dangers. And I'm thinking that if ZMAP or something like it can be ramped up, that's probably the treatment of choice. That's not a recommendation, that's just, a, that's just my opinion. Um, I don't want to get fired. Uh, okay. Um, ISARIC is developing um, a protocol for convalescent plasma collection in, um, in West Africa. And um, again, as I say, it uh, has been used in patients um, uh, evacuated to the U.S., uh, again, with indeterminate results. Um, other passive immunization schemes, uh, the Russians actually produced um, an IgG. Uh, years ago, it was actually shown to be pretty effective in non-human non primates. In delaying time to death, the primates developed uh, serum sickness, however, so that didn't really go anywhere. Um, there is an outfit in France called Fab Entech that is interested in making FAB2s. Uh, this technique has been used um, commercially for rabies and tetanus. Uh, we're meeting with them later this week to see about immunizing um, uh, probably some horses, um, perhaps with the uh, rabies vaccine uh, as a source for that antibody. And then another interesting um, uh, wrinkle on passive immunization is transchromosomatic cattle sera producing human monoclonal antibodies. Uh, this is being done in conjunction with um, uh, Stanford Applied Biologics, uh, and uh, those animals, uh, cattle, are being immunized now and um, will be available in four to six months. We tend to test all of these things in non-human primates at the, um, at the IRF. Um, turning to um, um, Tecmira, uh, this is the um, siRNAs uh, in lipid nanoparticles that target VP35 and the L-polymerase that silences viral genes. Uh, it has been shown to be 83% effective when initiated at 48 hours and 67% at 72. Uh, there is a phase one single ascending dose study that's been completed. The FDA put it on partial hold because there was some incidence of hypotension and cytokine release. Um, the thought now is that they will release the clinical hold uh, provided the dose is lowered somewhat. And um, it, it appears that, you know, uh, within three or four months there will be, you know, modest quantities of this available as well. Um, other antivirals, a little further back in the pipeline, um, the Sarepta product, PMOs, blocks viral protein production, uh, 60 to 80 percent effective in monkeys when tested an hour post-infection. Uh, phase one single ascending dose has been completed, and potentially 24 treatment courses uh, could be 
made available about now. Um, there's been a lot of interest in the VIP of air, T705. Uh, the Japanese government has this in great quantity and has suggested using it. It is licensed for, um, for influenza in Japan, currently in phase three for uncomplicated influenza. Bottom line, up front, it doesn't work. We've, I'm aware of studies that were done at USAMRD um, in which um, higher doses than the flu dose uh, were tested in monkeys and once again delayed time to death, but um, eventually it was still 100% fatal. Um, BioCrist is a small molecule viral polymerase inhibitor. Um, it, um, it again has shown good efficacy, 100% uh, efficacy uh, against Marburg, somewhat lower efficacy against Ebola. Uh, Preclinical studies with an IND submission is anticipated in November and potentially 2,000 treatment courses by next year. And then Bryn Sidofavir, made by uh, Chimerix. So this is actually, I think it's actually in the stockpile now for, for smallpox. Um, and it is a um, small viral polymerase inhibitor. It has in vitro activity against filoviruses. Um, it has been in phase three. Uh, the same drug for CMV and adenovirus, so there's a good safety record. There's potentially 3,500 treatment courses available, and it was used in the Dallas case, although unsuccessfully, um, you know, with the caveat that intervention was initiated uh, quite late in that disease course. Uh, we intend to test this one um, in the uh, guinea pig model. Um, uh, Bryn Sidofavir is rapidly metabolized in monkeys, so the non-human primate model is out. Uh, there are a number of strategies related to inhibition of the coagulation cascade. Um, two have been shown, uh, recombinant nematode anticoagulation, RNAPSI-2, you know, was somewhat effective in primates. Um, Zygris, now discontinued by Lilly, uh, was also shown to be somewhat effective, but again, its availability is un unknown. So those, those could conceivably be used in, in a, you know, intensive care unit. In the West, it's unlikely that these would have any uh, utility um, in West Africa. Uh, another thing is repurposing approved drugs. Um, you know, if you already have an approved drug and you can use it off-label, uh, so much the better. Uh, I'm going to put up, this is some raw data that just came off over the weekend, where we uh, looked at 3TC and AZT, uh, since those were being suggested for use in West Africa against, uh, uh, what is it, Karemaphene our positive control, and you can see basically it had no effect. Um, we tested it in uh, human liver cells, same thing, and in primary human macrophages, again, same thing. So I think 3TC and AZT are off the table. Um, uh, here just shows that the PMOs have sh some efficacy in, um, in this test. Uh, finally, interferons. There are multiple interferon products available. Um, blockade of type 1 receptors in NHP models uh, actually accelerates the disease. Um, basically, interferon beta, alpha 2, human interferon uh, have, you know, delayed time to death but have never been uh, uniformly effective. Um, adenovirus expressing interferon alpha extends the window for monoclonal antibody therapy um, after viremia. Um, and uh, it's interesting that uh, some uh, selective estrogen receptor modulators, CIRMs, including uh, clomiphene, um, they have a class effect without requiring a functional ER. It impacts late viral entry, 90% survival in a um, mouse model. Um, early studies in non-human primates indicated some ocular disturbances in males, but we may go back and test this again. Um, and finally, just a number of other drugs have been identified. You can see them listed there, all of which we will be testing to see if by some chance they actually work. Um, and then I think I'm running out of time. I am. Um, so just to say that, you know, you have to, in any of these things, you have to uh, continue to provide, you know, care for the severely ill patients, of course. And anecdotal reports that suggest that aggressive approaches to clinical care can improve uh, survival rates, as we've heard from some of the other speakers. So, in summary, there are no approved products, but novel products are in development. They are in limited availability. Some will be available sooner than others. There are approved products for other indications that may have therapeutic benefit. We're cranking through them. There are multiple vaccines under development that have the potential to have significant impact in the future if this field trial 
um, gets off in Liberia in December, I think you're going to see a change in that, in that epidemic curve that we've been looking at. Uh, but of course, it's unknown how well these will perform in people um, with Ebola. So with that, I think I'll stop and thank you for your attention.